Oh, jeepers! You're listening to Smash or Pass. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another interview on the JB and Millie channel. I am JB, and joining me, as always, is Millie. Hi. And we have Rihanna. Hi. And Devin. Hello. And our special guest today, we are welcoming to the show, Miguel A. Nunez Jr. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. My pleasure, guys. Where are you guys at? Um, well, I'm, we're both in the UK. We have Rihanna with us in the UK as well. And Devin? I'm from Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> What's up, Devin? How are you, you getting attacked? How'd you get attached, Devin? <laughs> yeah, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> All right, talk to me, guys. Talk to me. Welcome. Hello, everybody. So I I'm guess... in the UK. Hello, everyone in the UK. I mean, we're all very delighted to hear you all the way from rainy old England. Thank you so much. And I guess touching upon the background of your career, I understand that you've always wanted to become an actor, but how was your journey to get to that place? And what were some of the obstacles that you had to overcome? Oh, my God, really? I was born in New York, and I was raised, and my mother, um, she was raised in New York, in North Carolina, on a farm. She ran away to New York to, to pursue a career. She had me, I was born in New York, at three, maybe four years old, she took us and gave us to our grandmother because she had a farm and needed workers. So I ended up being raised in North Carolina on a farm since the day I could speak every single day of my life. I said, I want, I want to be a movie star. I'm going to be a movie star. My mother said when she spanked me once I was really little, I said, when I become a movie star, I'm not going to buy you nothing. And I don't even know where that came from. I, I, I hadn't watched television up to that point. Every single day of my life, that's what I said I was going to do. Um, I, they, when I first started school, I actually got a jean jacket and a magic marker and I wrote Hollywood on the back of it because that's where I was going to run away to go to Hollywood. I told everybody every day of my life from the first grade from the time I could speak to I graduated from school. And as soon as I graduated from school, I'm going to run away and I talked like this when I first got here because I was from the country because I really talked like this. Hold on. <clears throat> Can you see a difference in the lighting? All right. Is it working for you? Yeah, it's yeah it looks great. Yeah, looks good. Okay, okay, all right, because it looks dark on my side. Okay, so anyway, every day of my life I was working, and I was telling everybody that I'm going to be a movie star member, and every time they would see me coming, they would call me, my last name is Nunez, so they would call me Newt. Oh, he come Hollywood Newt. That was my nickname, because that's all he going to talk about, this Hollywood stuff. He going to Hollywood. I was told by every single person in my entire life, including my mother, there's no way you can become an actor. You're too skinny, you're too ugly, you're too poor, and you're too black. It's not humanly possible. I heard that from everybody. Not one single person in my entire life said, you can do it, go for it. They all said the same thing, but I understand where they were coming from because they were saying, you know, you're an A-B student. I was really smart. I, I, I could figure anything out. And you're doing well in school. You, you, you're really smart. You're quick. Don't do that because, you know, there are actors in New York, Chicago, Atlanta, Philadelphia, blah, 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 blah. Like an agent's manager's an actor. Uh, they're in the unions. They're in stage play. They got to add lawyers. Da, 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 da. How are your little skinny? I'm going to be frank with you and tell you exactly how I heard it. How in the hell is your little skinny black ass ever going to get in front of them? It's not possible. You're way out here deep, deep in the country where the next house is like a mile away. How is it? How are you? going to get in front of all of these actors that's all right you got to be sensible you got to be real and you got to think about your future and i don't want to hear nothing y'all got to say i guarantee you i'm going to be in a tv i guarantee you i'm going to be in the movies i don't know how it's going to happen i promise you on everything god is going to happen i said those very words every day of my life so when i graduated from school i was working at a tobacco warehouse i didn't know nothing else all I know is, well, I remember one time my uncle, they said he came home with a Cadillac because it was a Cadillac deal and they would drive him across country. And it had a California license plate and then I sat on the ground all day long till he left touching the license plate going, wow, this car was in California where I'm going to live my whole life. It was like that with me. Graduated school, started working at Process Tobacco. I crop tobacco, stick tobacco, hung tobacco, sucker tobacco, and crop tobacco. That's mean from the time they planted in the thing to the time it becomes a cigarette. Those were the jobs that I did. And working out in the field in the beginning, then you moved to the warehouse. I got my first check. It was like 
300. I was like, whoa! Wow. And then out of the clear blue sky, I already thought about what I was going to do that next weekend. I was going to save my money, and I was going to do this, and I was going to do that, and da 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 I said, I should go to California right now. This will be enough. Now, I graduated in June, July, August. So I wasn't even 17. I, I mean, I wasn't 18. Yeah, I was still 17 because I graduated 17 because my birthday don't come to after you graduate. And I had never been out of the city. And I still call every. I would have called you guys, ma'am and sir. And I was 4'11 and weighed 75 pounds when I graduated from high school. I was 50 pounds until the ninth grade. I'm sorry, the seventh grade. To the seventh grade, I was 50 pounds. And um, so I, was, I looked like I was 10 or 12. But I was like, I, I, I got to go. I got to do it. If I don't do it right now, I got the money. I'll never do it. And I'm going to be stuck in Wilson. And I just went, and I went home. I wrote a note, just like you see in the movies. I wrote a note, made three bologna sandwiches. I didn't know how long it took me to get there. I went to the bus station. And I went to the bus station. And the white man behind the counter, I said, can I get a ticket to, to Hollywood? He said, no. And my heart about to bump out of my chest because I'm at the, at the bus station, which is right in the middle of the town in Wilson. And my grandparents and them had to come home and pass the bus station. And if they saw me, I would have got killed because we got real beatings like y'all read about in the movies. Um, so I'm scared. And he goes, no, you can't go to Hollywood. So I said, you can go to Los Angeles. I said, okay. And I said, okay, that's California. He said, yeah. I said, okay, let's go. And I bought a ticket and I went in the back of here. I'm going to skip a little bit. The reason he said, I thought, this is how naive I was. I thought you had to be an actor to get into Hollywood. because he, But what I didn't find out, which was later, was I was at Trailway Station. Trailway goes downtown L.A. Greyhound went to Hollywood. I didn't know that. I just thought I couldn't get into Hollywood because I wasn't an actor. So, but the Greyhound bus, I mean, the, 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 the uh, downtown LA, the bus station where they drop them off, lands you at, um, on Skid Row, the absolute number one slum, worst street in the entire state. I think it was probably in the entire state, second to Second to uh, 42nd Street back then in New York at the time. It may even have been first in the entire United States, maybe in the world. It was the most, it was the, the nastiest. It's called Skid Row. It's called Skid Row. When it was called, they were, at the time I was there, they had a Skid Row slash or somebody that was walking around slashing uh, 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 homeless people's necks. And that was going on when I land. Now, I'm, I'm, and I, I thought when I got here, I was going to see all those movie lights and, and, and movie star cars. First, it took me five days on the bus. And I thought I was going to see those lights. I was going to meet some movie stars and that was going to be it. I was going to be an actor. I never once realized the seriousness of what I had done until I actually landed on Skid Row. And it wasn't what I thought. And I looked around. That's when everything hit me. I didn't even know what to think. I didn't. I was so afraid. I didn't know what to do. And so I went to put my suitcase in the thing and I was sleeping in the bus station. They kicked me out. So I started sleeping behind the bus station. I went to a movie theater down the street because it was $2. It was a dollar for a movie all night. And I got there in October. So uh, um, so now I'm there and it's kind of cold. So I go and I go to this movie theater, one dollar, and I got my feet up in the chair because it's big ass rats are running across your feet. And in North Carolina, we had a little box rape. No. Okay. I should have put my uh, do that. I should have put do not disturb sign. I had a little box razors. You pop a razor out and they cut boxes open in the supermarket. We kept those in our pockets. So I had mine in my hand like this. And this is God's way of taking care of me early. And there was a head in the movie theater all the way down close to the three screen. So like every time I would wake up, it was closer and closer. And at the last minute, some big nasty ass bum sitting next to me. I popped my razor on him. He jumped up and ran. I walked outside. And from that point on, I just walked around at night and slept in the day. And like I said, I went weeks and to this day, I can't even tell you, I didn't know what to think. I was raised on a farm. I was raised up, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. You get up in the morning, you go to breakfast, you go to school, you're in the home, you're in the bed by 11, 10, 11 o'clock. Matter of fact, 11, that's not even possible. I mean, I had graduated from school, still had to be in the bed, in the house before sundown. That's the kind of family we grew up in, the shit you read about in, in, in movies. And my grandparents were preachers too. And so... I, I, I just walked around. I never knew you could literally walk around sleeping while you, sleep while you was walking. I didn't know that was possible. I thought that was only in the movies. One day I'm, on, on, I'm sleeping in a park bench. It's raining outside. And like I said, I look like a child and I'm sleeping under the bench because it was raining. I was like, hey, what are you doing here? 
why are you doing the street little, 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 little he thought I was a kid and he was like tell him my name is Miguel Nunez I came off my name is Miguel Nunez I'm from 640 Cemetery Street Wilson North Carolina I came here being an actor and he was like oh god and I always wonder why everybody was like oh god so you know he told me don't don't sleep in the street go to the Union Rescue Mission if you go to the Union Rescue Mission now, it's a huge multi-million dollar facility. You tell an amazing Jewish couple that died and left them to it, and it's saving millions and millions of lives. But then it was just a hole in the wall downtown LA on Skid Row where nasty bums could come in and sleep on pews until the next morning and get out of the cold. If you get there before seven, so at least I was inside and I wake up the old man, it was funky and I'd wake up scratching and found that I was covered in lice. They take you downstairs, they spray you with poison and they wash your clothes and, and they give you beans with, that were still hard. I mean, right now they live, they get the whole spread, the homeless folks at the new mission. And there's a picture of me, the other people that have graduated there. So anyway, I used to go around and I, would, I, I, I had no money to eat. So I would sell my blood plasma to eat. You go downstairs, you sell your blood plasma and uh, 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 you can do it twice a week. And back, it's probably a lot more now, but back then it was like, seven dollars if you sell your blood plasma and then they give you seven dollars at least i could go get me like a they had a popeye's chicken meal or, um, it was called churches but i uh, hear there or I'll go to the height regency wishing well and steal coins out of the wishing well i i couldn't get a job uh name uh my name uh, address and there uh, a phone number and, and didn't have one uh, experience, uh, uh nothing i couldn't get an ad i couldn't get a call back I didn't know what to do. I ended up jumping on trucks and delivering those little annoying papers, sticking them in people's door um, and work from eight to six and they give you like $20, but at least it was something. And, and um, so anyway, um, uh, I ended up getting a job. Finally, I got on welfare. And then welfare got me a job at Rancho Los Amigos Hospital in Downey, California as a physical therapist technician assistant under the CEDAR program, that was just the welfare program. Instead of giving people free food and money, we're gonna put you on county facilities to work and give you a check. So instead of you just getting a check every day on welfare, now you're gonna work at this county facility, that county facility, this county building, you're gonna pick up trash at this county facility, you're gonna do this, and then you're gonna earn a little bit more than what we're giving you, you're gonna earn a salary. So I started doing that, worked two years, saved my money. I said, this is not what I wanted to do. I came here to be an actor. I told my supervisor, my supervisor said, um, you know, just say you're going into the military and God bless her soul. And if you don't work out, you can always come back and say you got discharged. I got that, saved up my money uh, by then. Uh, uh, by now, I know you can go into Hollywood by now. And I'm getting an apartment in Hollywood and, and brought four of the guys from the, 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 the little uh, uh, um, sh uh, shitty, um, uh, once you get on welfare, they give you a hotel to stay in downtown LA. So I was staying in the county hotel where you just sign a voucher and three meals a day at a busy bee restaurant and you just sign a voucher for your lunch. That was the welfare, that was what they were giving you. And then you get uh, $227 every two weeks on top of that, that was the welfare. So they were saying, listen, but once you get your first check, once they put you on the counter, now you're on your own. The hotel was only $60 a month. You wouldn't wanna own the hotel or the restaurant if they gave it to you free. You wouldn't have eaten there if somebody put a gun to your head. But to me, it was the Hilton, and I don't care what that restaurant looked like. They were shooting the rat away while they cook it. I don't care. I, it was food. Um, so I ended up doing that, right? And now, one day, I'm on a... And I said, listen, so I paid my rent up, right? Now, I'm on a bus, and there's some guy like this. And I said, hey, what you doing? He said, I'm an actor. I said, hi, my name is Gail Nunez. I'm 640 Cemetery Street, Wilson, North Carolina. I came out here to be an actor, da, da, da. And he goes, I said, well, what is that? He said, this is a resume. You're going to have to hear. Take this. You have to get a resume. You know, da, da, da. I, I, what else? And then you're going to get an agent, blah, 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 blah. And what is this? She going on. It's called a cattle call. You know, it's for Gino's restaurant, blah, blah, blah. I see him get out and I look in the, in, over in the park and I see cameras. And so I go to the next, I get off on the next stop. And I go to a copy place and he had a little resume thing he gave me. I write his name out and put my name in it, went back to the park. I got in line and I got the lead in that Gino's restaurant commercial. I didn't have an agent. He ended up taking me back to his agent when he found out I got it. He was still there. And I'm just making a long story short. Cause, and so anyway, I ended up going to his agent and then his agent says, I know my name is Miguel Nunez with North Carolina. And that, that, that. So you have to work on your accent. But of course, I'm going to sign you because I like you. And then from that point on, I think the next... 50 auditions he sent me on I probably got 47 of them and then I was on tour of duty in 1987 when I got here in 80 so seven years later I was on network tv series tour of duty on 
And that was from never having anybody tell you you can or you can't do something. Don't let anybody tell you you're capable, what you are capable or not capable of. And never take no for an answer. And I'll give you an example. Once I was there, I was like, I want to go into Universal Studio Tour and I want to walk all around the stages and I want to uh, see how they do it and just look and I can learn that way. And they was like, man, them, shut up. They, they ain't going to let you walk in there and walk around on the studio. You can take the Universal Studio Tour. They can show you how to do that. I'm like, I don't want to do that. I want to see the real actors. They're not going to let you do it. No, I ain't paying no attention to him. So I take my little skinny ass down to your Universal. I walk up to that gate. I said, hi, my name is Miguel Nunez. I'm 6 Point Cemetery Street, Western North Carolina. I came here to be an actor, and I won't get in nobody's way. I just want to see and learn how to do it. And, and, and he was like, man, get your ass out of here. You can't come in here and get your skinny ass out of here. I didn't understand. He won't let you, and you can't. Those things never computed to me because there's always a way. So I said, okay. So I went up, saved my money, sold my blood plasma. I went, saved my money, I went and took the Universal Studio Tour. And on the Universal Studio Tour, there's a part of the tour where everybody gets off and they say, okay, everybody line up over here. Okay. Everybody line up against the wall over here. Now, we're going to go into here and we're going to show you how they make movies. It's, these are actors, and you're gonna, but you will get a sense of how it's done, blah, 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 blah. And the, the trams are going to pick us up on the other side. So... Was going to walk through, all right, come on, come on, come this way, come this way, come this way, come this way. While everybody was coming this way, coming this way, I was going that way, going that way. And I went the other way and walked around the studios and they were shooting all these big movies and I just went up to the top and I would sit down and I would just watch all day. And I found out the last one left at 5.30 so I knew what time I had to be back and just get back in line to take the last one on out. And I did exactly what I said I wanted to do, I learned a lot. I did exactly what all my, they, Tim telling me, they are not gonna let you. I did exactly what the guy at the gate saying, you cannot do. I did it. There's always a way, don't ever feel that you are bound by what somebody say you capable. Somebody told me every time you skinny, I didn't get mad. I like, okay, cool. It fueled me, let it fuel you. You know what you are and whatever that passion is that you have inside, the thing that you have inside that, that you would do even if it was for free. That's what you got to think. If you got that kind of passion, I would do this if it was free. If somebody said, listen, we ain't got no money, but we want you to star in the next Star Wars. You don't think I'm going to do it? <laughs> That's what it is. And you can't let nobody stop you. You can't let anybody tell you what you can or cannot do. If you ever want to see me homeless, living in the street, this little skinny person I'm telling you about, look at a movie called Jumping Jack Flash. In the movie Jumping Jack Flash, when they were shooting this movie, I was homeless living downtown on the street. And I used to steal food off of the truck because they had all this food in the parking lot. You know how they're moving food, all this food. And they were like, yeah, yeah, shoot you. One day I was like, the producers, hey, hey, leave him alone. And the producer's name is Joel Silver, one of the biggest producers in the business at the time, still to this day. And um, did all the predators and everything, uh, diehards. And, and I was like, he was like, hey, was, hi, my name is Guillermo yeah, Nunez, M640 Cemetery Street. I'm coming from Whistle. I came in here being an actor. Da, da, da. He's all right, all right, let, let him be, let him be, let him be. I ain't got nowhere to stay. I'm living down here right by the bus station. Nah, 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 nah. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the Ford Hotel, 1007 East. 1007 East 7th Street, four hotel. He said, you know what, let him eat. So he would let me eat. And one day he goes, you know what? Come here, come here. I'm going to put you in this scene. So now, the next time you watch Jumping Jack Flash, there's a scene where Whoopi Goldberg first gets, she gets dressed up for the first time in the movie. And she has a dress on and she's going to see Jumping Jack Flash. The next time you watch that, when she starts walking down the sidewalk, Joe Silver's over here, he's like, go. And I walk in, I went, hey, baby. What you doing? You are huge. Get your, get your skinny ass out of here. And that's me. And you'll see me. And then you can see me at that particular time. <laughs> but anyway, so. Wow. I mean, it certainly sounds like it was, you know, written for you that this is what you were going to do. Like, almost like your first words were that you were going to be an actor and you've done it. I and knew it. <laughs> and so I know you said that, like, you knew it before you'd even really sat and watched TV and watched actors but do you remember ever watching you know when you did first watch you know televisions movies things like that seeing any actors that you're like okay they inspire me that's 
the kind of performance I want to do or anything like that? I grew up in the country. I grew up 97% of my entire life, childhood outside. I remember distinctly, I don't remember any movies, any TV shows, any actors, none of those. We had not one, not one. The, uh, the first TV show I, wa I remember watching, first movie I remember watching, and you can look at the date of it, um, <laughs> see how old I was. I mean, we watched Flintstones. Now that's, we watched the Flintstones. I watched cartoons. Until, even when I came to California, uh, uh, until I was 30, all I watched was cartoons all day long. To this day, all I watch is Family Guy. But, 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 <laughs> special on TV. Um, I, I had no, none. I remember distinctly coming, doing exactly like this. As if you're, because I was raised, my grandparents took my brothers. I have seven brothers. So as soon as they got three, gave them grandmothers. Next one gave my grandmother. And we had five aunts living there. And all they did was read books and watch TV. I did just like this. And leave. And I literally, I literally would go outside and I go, I because I'd never never watched TV. I'm going, how could somebody sit and watch a box all day? I literally did not understand it. I literally said those words in my lifetime on at least three or four different occasions, watching people watch TV going, what is this? What is it? How can what is this? What is thing? What is on there? What may what are you guys watching? How can you sit here all day and watch this thing? I literally was that amazed at people not even understanding. I want to be an actor and people watch me. Never, none of that crossed me. I'll be outside uh, of doing like, and my friend, one of my friends I went to school with, he just reminded me, he said, you remember you used to do this thing every time we were together. You were like, when we were little, you were like, okay, guys, I want to stop. Okay, now here is a person first discovering matches. And you would do this thing, <laughs> and I would do all this stupid acting every time we get together. That's all they remember. I didn't have a favorite actor, none of that. Never had any actor that I saw. Or I, could, I could even tell you none of that. It was already in here. <laughs> That's all I can say. It was already in there. I knew it every single thing I said exactly what happened. And you can't call it because that's what the Bible says anyway. If you say it enough times, it'll happen. Tr promise you, try it. That is that is yeah. absolutely in crazy to hear your story and how you've kind of like made yourself an actor, the actor that you are today without even having inspiration from other actors around you. And now that you're kind of in the actor's shoes yourself, is there any inspiration or inspirational words that you'd give to any aspiring actors that are growing up like you were growing up or? Anything like that. That's exactly, yeah, exactly what I just said. Don't let anybody tell you what you're capable of doing or not doing. Don't let anybody tell you what you, what's, what's in you. Don't let anybody tell you what you're capable of doing. You can do, any, I'm living proof, you can do anything you want with nothing. I came, I, I matter of fact, I'm a prime example. I, I didn't have nothing and nobody in it. I came from the furthest, most point you could possibly be to enter it. Deep, 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 deep in the country, way out in North Carolina, Wilson, North Carolina, right? Then came to California when I got in it, came here and was lower than anybody else here because because I didn't have any money. And not only did I have any money, every step I took this way, I was lost. Every step I took that way, I was lost. Every step I took, I was lost. I had no relatives, no money, no nothing. So I went from the furthest possible point you can be to achieve it to the lowest possible point you can achieve it with nothing and no family support because they were poor and couldn't. And if I can do it, I guarantee, and in and, and, and a business, which is like the hardest possible business to get into, you can. Don't let nobody tell you you can. And they're gonna try to discourage you. And a lot of people will try to discourage you, even your closest friends. And it's not so much well, jealousy, but some of it is, is that you no, know, they see where their life is. They don't have the desire. They don't have those dreams. You, they sit and listen to you dream it, and they, 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 it, it hits them all in here. They feel it for you. They want it for you. But when it comes time, you're going to be leaving them. You're going to be leaving them, and 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 now they're going to be alone in in what they don't and where you are, and 
it hurts them. So a lot of people don't really want you to. They want you to be succeed, but they don't want you to. I mean, you know what I mean. So you got to look for what inspires you, what motivates you, what you want, where you are, and you got to go according to it. Even if you have to hurt somebody's feelings, it doesn't matter. My grandparents were strict. That's why I wrote a note and didn't tell nobody. I know it hurt them. I know it was going to hurt them. I know they was going to be devastated. I know the phone was going to be ringing. Every relative, that boy, my, that ran away. That boy, I, I know it was going to happen. I know they were the preachers the, in the in the whole community. I know they were going to be like, hey, right? you know, I don't know how what spend they put on it when I left, but but when I went back and bought them homes and cars, and I, they were my biggest fans. And and, and no matter what somebody may feel now, don't worry about it. Success is the best revenge and don't try to get revenge on my somebody I, I say turn the other cheek and just just do it do a chris rock you don't have to turn the other cheek but just take it you know just take it <laughs> and, 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 and keep it rolling oh wow that's it's like really inspiring because looking at it in my life i've had so many people say that i can't do certain things because of like my illness and disability and things like that but it's just made me want to work harder and I know for a fact after we get off like this interview, I'm going to be working even harder because you know that's exactly it's right. It's yeah, incredible. exactly. Just exactly what you just said. Let it motivate you. Every time somebody say you can't do now, you this. I was like, okay, you're going to see. And now I go back, and they all run around me like little puppies. Exactly what they're going to be doing to you, all of them. And 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 a lot of times, a lot of them will say stuff not because they believe it. Because they want you to believe it, so it stops you from leaving them. It stops you from getting it. Because unless you know you want to bring them up, now you can see if you said to a friend, well, "I'm going to be doing this, and I'm going to be doing this, and I'm going ready to do this, and I'm going to do this," I'm, 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 and that that person is going to likely become like that unless they're truly a friend of your family. If you say to that same person, "I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that," you know what? You're going to be my manager. You're going to come with me. Woo! Then they're going to be all on you. All on you there. They're going to be all with you, wanting to support you, bring you. And it is important, though, to have somebody close to you from now before you make it. Because those are the people that love you and know you the most and close to you. So remember that as well. Yeah. I definitely will. Thank you. And, you know, right. you, you is like such an icon of classic horror, notably from Return of the Living Dead. And this movie also starts Scream, Scream Queen Linnea Quigley. And what was it like to work with her? I love, I just, I just did, we did a big autograph show. I love, love, love Linnea. She is the, the, the coolest girl in history. To this day, right now, we just did something. She doesn't care about nothing. She would go and flow and whatever and anything. I, her personality is, is infectious. I love her to death. She is everything you see. She doesn't have an attitude. She's loving, gracious to everybody. And I, I truly adore her. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, I, I, yeah. It's just such a great, iconic film, though, and especially with it being, I guess, set and made in the 1980s. Your character, of course... Um, Keep going! I'm so sorry. Um, your character <laughs> is, I guess, a representative. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Wow. Oh, <laughs> that's literally... Brains. Oh, oh no. <laughs> that's amazing the tar man oh my gosh just so many iconic moments from that yes but i guess with your character oh, being in the we're doing forefront a, we're doing a thing. They, they're talking about return living day no, oh, no, 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 oh. oh wow damn you pretty girl what your name is <laughs> 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 oh my gosh that's amazing i can't that's believe so that that's just such a great I, I've done so many horror movies. you know what's weird when i first when i first left north carolina one of my favorite things is horror movies still to this day and i always said and it's weird like i say you say things i said i want to i used to say a lot i'm gonna do horror movies i'm gonna do horror movies and when i got here the first one was friday 13 return of the living dead then i did connoisseur leprechaun um, um shadow zone and all horror and it kind of happened I mean, I guess the vibe of that movie, which I think the sequels kind of lost, was very punk rock. It was very 1980s punk uh -huh. rock, iconic. And at the time, there weren't many representatives of the black community, the people of color community in punk rock. So what was it like to be at the forefront of that, of that tonal shift, that change? 
I literally had to look it up because I had been hanging out in the clubs at that time. And every single black punk rock group I know had this one black guy in it <laughs> that we always going, what is he doing there? It was always one black guy. And he always had on like jeans and his boot and some little uh, scarf tied around his boot. I actually imitated my guy from one of the guys I had seen out in the clubs all the time. <laughs> and I always kind of knew those guys, how they are. They always had one guy in those groups. Wow. It's just so amazing to hear about that. And I guess, like you say, you know, just to switch up the scene a bit, um, when you were talking about what you used to watch, you mentioned a lot of cartoons. So I guess prior to being cast in the live action Scooby-Doo movie, did you ever watch any of the Scooby-Doo cartoons? Oh, no, 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 no. I'll take that back. Scooby-Doo too. <laughs> Scooby-Doo too. I watched them all. I love Scooby-Doo. Yeah, oh. I, 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 that was one of the films I was so excited to get. Especially we shot it off the coast of Brisbane, Australia, on a place called Tangaluma Island. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely stunningly beautiful. Street Fighter, we actually shot in Australia as well, which was in, or oh, in the, the, the place we shot Street Fighter for six months was called, and get this, Surfer's Paradise. That's, that's the name where we shot. It was awesome. But Scooby-Doo, we shot off the island. You get up in the morning, you walk out, they be a guy standing out there with a little bag of fish. What is that? And he would pay him two dollars. He said, "You'll see." And then at a certain time, the dolphins would bring, and they would stop and let their little babies come in and cook. And they you feed them. You'd be like 10, 20 dolphin babies around your legs to get the fish, and you could rub them and, and touch them and everything. Ooh. They just take it. Oh. It was a beautiful Tangaluma Island. Oh, wow, it was it, awesome. <laughs> it certainly sounds like it was awesome, and it looks incredible. Mm -hmm. Like to this day like we see you know things with Tangaluma and it's just it still looks exactly the same and like you know you've come across as someone who always manages to go out and really fight and get what it is that what you, that they want and you said that Scooby-Doo was a movie that you were really happy to get so how was it that you got cast in the movie? Hey they told me they, to come in and do the scene you know where the middle of May that scene oh, yeah. mm -hmm. that scene when they first walk up and um and and everything you I remember some of the stuff that you saw in the film, I added. I think that, um, um, and the way I did it, one with the chicken and everything, they said, they want you to do it. So I, was, I just went in and just put it out. I was like, so what am I sacrificing? The chicken? I said, okay, I can just have fun with it. He said, all right, just have fun. I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, <laughs> I just, and they did exactly what you did. And I just made up all this, this stuff and this stuff. And then they would, yeah, yeah. And then I, I just, Killed it, killed it. Oh gosh, well, oh uh, I mean, uh, it was so great. It's great that they kind of just gave you that scene, like you say, you got to put your personality into it. And I think that comes through in the movie so well as all the character is just, like you say, that scene is just so fun to watch back. It really is. And you're talking about Tango Yeah, oh, yes. the entire mm -hmm. movie is amazing. But so you're talking about Tango Luma. What was it like to go and shoot there? Because like you say, you know, you, I guess you know you'd never been to LA and Hollywood before and you were just so you know confident and incredible to make that journey on your own and do that kind of thing and then traveling all the way out to Australia as well like what was that process like and how long were you there for on the movie? On well, the movie I think I was in uh, uh, for Scooby-Doo it was I think maybe three months and for uh, uh, Street Fighter it was about four months five months mm -hmm. but it was to me because you got to remember Everything I've ever done, all the big movies, everybody's like, so what do you think about him? Every movie I've ever done, even with the big stars in every film, I never really looked at them twice, never even gave them a time of day. I was never one of those actors like this. I never really even, hey, how you doing? What's your name? Mel Gibson? Hey, that's right, you're the star of this. All right, okay, good. All right, anyway, and keep rolling. I wouldn't even stand there and talk to him like everybody would. I never looked at it. I always looked at every single movie in wonder and awe at the whole thing. I was so happy I got Scooby-Doo. It's a big movie with Scooby-Doo. This is, I'm on Scooby-Doo. That's how I was thinking. Oh, my God, I'm in Friday the 13th. I'm at a, oh, God, I'm in a, in a Living Dead movie. Every single thing is a joy to me. I take nothing for granted. No, no job is too small and no job is too big. Let me explain. I've gotten a major feature film from one scene in a TV show. I've gotten a TV series from one scene in a movie. 
So all you that everything you get going there, like I just do and do it, I'm showing, just lob it up and knock it out the park. I've done see movies where when you go to the screening, you know, I maybe, you know, maybe got five lines in a movie, sometimes even two or three. And there's other black guys in it who's like the stars and the killer. And you get there first and then and you're going in the line before you go in. They're like, hey, 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 Miguel. Okay, all right, right, right. All right, no, 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 no. waiting on the stars to get there. Okay. And when the and when we come out, they're stepping on the star's face to find me to get me to do an interview. And I only had two lines. I can take a movie with two lines. I don't care if you got a hundred, you give me the right two lines. Ain't nobody gonna remember nothing you did when I finish. Every job you get, knock it out the park. You don't know what it's gonna do. You don't know who's gonna see it. A, 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 a executive producer was on an airplane watching a film and saw me in a scene and landed and had them call me and I ended up getting a big TV series. You don't know. So never take any job for granted. And I never saw anything as being, and everybody said, what was your favorite? My favorite is different from what they're expecting me to say. My favorite is shit like Scooby-Doo because we were on Tangaloom Island and Street Fighter because we were in Australia and they gave us the biggest per diem and they gave us sort of like a 3,000 uh, 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 3, square foot, $10 million place to live in with our own security next door, with our own this next door, with a driver everywhere we're going because Capcom did it, the Japanese company. They put up all of this money and they treated us as if we were uh, uh, princes in Saudi Arabia every single day, free karate lessons, everything. My reasons for liking them is not why they say, oh, what's your favorite reason? You know, I like it because you're not working with this person, you know, and working with uh, all of that old active shit. I don't know nothing about my, my, my like. My favorite for liking because Tangaluma Island was just so beautiful. It was on the other side of the world. It was just, I never been to Australia. It was just that kind of shit is what I like. I'm still in awe of everything, even to this day. I can I can only imagine. I wish I could go to Australia. I wish I could see, you know, even even just the the sets with with everything built up, you know. I feel like that'd be truly amazing to see. And it's really oh, cool. Bro. Like hearing like that you that it's nice because those scenes from Scooby Doo are absolutely some of my favorites that you're in. And it's nice hearing that you really put yourself into those scenes because that makes it like all the more special. Um that's it's just beautiful. And is there is there any scenes that you can remember like that you talked about like inserting more of yourself in the scenes is there anything that got cut from the original movie that you were in or things that were planned that didn't f fully make it is there anything that you you might have ad-libbed and improvised and they were like mm, we oh no that. Is there anything you remember from that no but there were some scenes cut but there were some scenes cuts from everyone but it wasn't because of what i said or didn't say it was because of the because of uh, uh the at the time because they had a lot of stuff in there so it wasn't anything i said because pretty much everything i, I said got in but I, you were saying something about how much, when I remember this, when we were pulling in, we flew to, they flew us into Brisbane and put us up at the hotel uh, for one, for 24 hours because the flight was so long. The next morning, then we boarded this big yacht and the yacht drives takes us 45 minutes, maybe an hour, 45 minutes to get to Tangaluma Island. But one of the things that was cool, like you were just saying, is when your boat was driving in, that big, remember that big uh, thing they had that looked like opening up a mouth in the docks when you did the whole the whole parade thing, all of that was up. So it looked like, whoa, it really looked like a spooky eye. All that shit, was, it really looked like, whoa, hold on now. It was really cool. Whoa. Man, to, I, I would kill to like, to have that just have spooky island be like a real place, you know, to go be able to oh, visit it, there. Oh, it should have been. That's a great <laughs> idea. If they would have, if they had done that, turn that into a real spooky island with rides and stuff and people come <laughs> over there, it will, you're right. That would have been Oh, huge. my God. So many because, people would have been oh. And this is what they did, which I <laughs> – on they don't have that many um, um, living places. They have a hotel, but they had condominiums right on the beach. So all of us, the stars, we got the ones that were right on the water. And the crew. So it wasn't that many. So – and then and, and I didn't know – so they took 100 tents. And they lined up this huge field and paved it. And they put a street down the middle, they put up poles and electricity. Then they put another 100 tents, that's 200, on the other side, and lights and, and, and plug-in cords. I'm like, what is that? Then the, then the boat started coming in. They had 200 teenage girls, I'm sorry, 100 teenage girls and 100 teenage boys. And they stayed there the whole time. And air, now at nighttime, it was like parties and it was like da, 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 music and everything going. It was like a tent village party that they created. They were going from tent to like a little community because they were there for a while. And they had the tent, they had the little 
phone cords and stuff going through the like a real telephone wires and everything. It was awesome. It was called Extra Village. <laughs> Man, that <laughs> I didn't know anything about that actually. That's kind of like really interesting. I guess with so many extras and so many people on set. They all of those have... extras, they yeah, they had a tent village. They didn't have nowhere for those kids. It was yeah, dope. that's crazy. their own little town. That's kind of fun. I like that. <laughs> um, on 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 a a learning aspect of the movie, because you know, like you said, you never you never watch TV shows and things growing up, so you're kind of learning as you go and as you as you go. And in past interviews, you mentioned that you like to try to learn a little bit from each director that you work with. Was there anything from Raja Gosnell that you that you took away, like specifically from working on Scooby Doo with him? I, every single director, I, I can't remember exactly what, because I just take it and I can't, put, can't compartmentalize it. Everything that I learn into something. And if I was going to be in, it's okay, wait, shit, who's the one that did that? And who the one that did that? It'd be too hard. But I do yeah. remember him being him being so open for the to and him smiling and him just, and some, some, some directors are technical. You know, and they're real technical. And some directors lead the technical to the technicians and they would work with the actors. He was like that. You know, he was like both. He was like this. And, and when a director talks to an actor and they're looking at you and you really feel like they're talking with you and they're looking in your face and they're telling you something, it seems like, it feels like they're really concerned about what you're doing in this role. But if they're like this, okay, look, I need you to do that, da, 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 and they ain't even looking at that, da, da, da. It's like they're trying to insert their own little ego thing on it. But I've learned something from every single director. Everyone has been great. I don't think I've ever worked with but one bad director. And we actually, it was on a TV show tour duty and we all got together and we told the producers, you got to fire and he had about four more episodes a week, so we're not going to work. So the producer said, okay, just give him one more chance, okay? And if you don't like him, we'll replace him. And he turned out to be our favorite director in the entire four years on the show. <laughs> I don't know what he said, but he turned out, you just got to give people a chance. You just got to give people a chance. Oh, wow. It sounds like you've got so many incredible memories. And I know you say you, you said that you weren't really the one who would make a big deal of like the actors that you were working with, but your main scene, you worked with Sarah Michelle Gellar and she played Daphne. And it's one of the scenes that for us sticks out the most because it's so funny and like you brought all the charisma that was needed. And what was it like to work with Sarah Michelle Gellar? Because Daphne was kind of like polar opposites to your character. I adore her. She, uh, she and I and her husband actually became friends. Yes, we became friends after that. And we still, I still talk to him to this day. I adore her. She was like, a, a, actually, she was like a big star at the time because she had been on the Buffy show. Mm -hmm. But when she came in, she act like just a regular old uh, extra that don't know nothing. She was just the sweetest, generous, kindest. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's funny. Did I, yeah, yeah. Laughing, just awesome, awesome person. Awesome person. And I, and I love her and him to this day. And there are two, actually, two I uh, really only hate still, still talking to talk to him, her, him and her from the whole film. I don't really talk to anybody else, but only because I don't see them, but I've seen him recently. And uh, I, I think they're two of the greatest. And I'm so glad they got together. I yes. knew it was going to happen. Yes. And I said, if they get together, they're going to be married forever. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you never see them out in the press trying to get some TikTok news. You never see them in it doing anything. <laughs> They just living their life, living, loving, and with them and their family. And oh gosh, that is so true. Like that's just amazing. It's so great to hear you say that. And I guess oh, kind of moving on, like you say that you don't really speak with anyone else that was involved in that movie. But in terms of your time there, did you do you have a favorite memory that stands out to you the most from working on the Scooby Doo movie? Uh, my favorite time was. Well, I guess it would have to be, shoot, I had so many favorite times working on that movie. It had to be with the Dolphins and the scene with me, and the first scene with me and Daphne on the thing, because it was just me and her and the whole crew on me and her. And we were just sitting there coming up with all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, that's funny. Do that one we did the first time when you went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of that stuff, that had to be my favorite day. Because like, it felt like the whole crew was there for you. You and that, you know, the whole crew was right there. And really at that particular point, they are. So that was probably one of my favorite days. I mean, your character, like you say, kind of going through different ways of presenting the lines and what you're doing, but there's so many lines in there that's memorable, like, um, you know, working out when the chicken didn't have a head and stuff like that. It's so funny. And your character was presented to have all these wonderful kind of 
thoughts and theories about what was going on on the island and how to stop being possessed by the demons and yours was one of the only characters that didn't get possessed so was it ever discussed that maybe these you know theories and you know the thing with the chicken and things actually worked well you know what the director actually said that but i think he i think he mentioned something like that because i wanted to i'm like why can't i get like <laughs> like that and he was like no you're a voodoo they won't come near you that's what he said no you're a voodoo they're not gonna come near you i wanted to do that i wanted to go <laughs> you know i wanted to do that <laughs> <laughs> and you also fear so like we said we have this kind of the earlier scenes where they're trying to work out what's going on on the island but you're also in one of the last scenes as well where um the where they're trying to explain the mystery to the reporters and kind of what happened was that one of the last scenes to film it was that how, what was that, that like? was, was the last like no yeah that was the last scene and it's so weird because they had me come right out in front. I'm like, oh shit, okay. And I can't remember. We all lined up when we yeah. went to yeah. them when it came up. I, that was the that was the last that was the last shot. And I do remember that. Was, everybody was happy that shot. Everybody who was in it was happy because you know this is the last shot. I'm in it. You know, that, that's it all feels like thinking. a nice conclusion to kind of bring everyone yeah. together for the last scene. Absolutely, absolutely. That's the director. <laughs> Speaking of the the very last scene in the movie and also like the cool sets and props and everything that you got to be surrounded with the entire time you were in Australia, did you by chance get to take anything home with you? Any cool props? Any special uh, I, it's so funny you say that. I take something from all my damn every movie I, I, I've been on. I got some good shit, but the only thing I wanted, he would not give me. He kept saying he was going to give it to me, the director. He kept saying he was going to give it to me. And then at the last minute, he did. So I didn't worry about nothing there because it was all I wanted. So it was too late to claim something because they always give that shit away, most of it. Um, and the Arnuki beast. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, and the oh. production designer said that he wanted the same thing as well, but he didn't, yeah. he didn't get oh, to get it either. Uh, so there was so many I people wanted that wanted that. Where did it go? <laughs> I don't know who got I think the director got it. God, I wanted that Arnuki beast so bad. Damn, oh, I wanted it so, so bad. Cool. It would have been. I kept saying, dude, I was like, dude, you can keep this pot of money. You don't have to give me for a day. I was like, everything. He was like, wait, just wait, wait. I didn't say no. I didn't say no. You got to wait till the end of the movie in case we don't need it again. And then I think he ended up telling me, you know, you'll get it. But, you know, just in case there's a pickup shot, which I know is all a lie now that I know I'm a producer. I know that was a lie. But, yeah, I really wanted that. I'm disappointed for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good. Now that it's like the 20th anniversary, hopefully... Like maybe they could just like surprise you and send send you like a replica or something. We we need to find <laughs> do you. you he, do you hear them, Universal? <laughs> send me the Arnuki Beast. <laughs> uh. So once the movie came out, did you attend the premiere? Absolutely, one hundred percent. Absolutely, <laughs> I went. I went straight straight away. Of course. Um, so <laughs> You're, of course, well known for a number of roles, but have you ever been exclusively recognized for the Fuji Maestro? Oh, 100%. Lots of times with children. You know, something, and it always freaks me out. I'm like, he was in Scooby Doo. I'm like, how, how, I'm like, it always amazes me that they know because my hair was different. A lot of times, like, a lot of people are recognized in Scooby Doo. Lots. Wow. Is... And it always surprises me because of the hair difference. A lot of people say it's your voice. This mm. is the voice. I mean, it's so cool because a lot of people that you kind of speak to, it's like they're always known for that one thing that stood the test of time. But with you, there's so many things that it's like 20 years later, 25 years later, it's still <laughs> held up. And I guess in regards to Scooby, what does it feel like to be part of that movie that people still love, you know, currently now, even celebrating its 20th anniversary? It's so weird because I've been fortunate and blessed enough that, like, um, or Return of the Living Dead to be in a film that's last so long and has stood the test of time. Um, um, uh, franchises like Friday the 13th and, 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 and classic shows that we grew, all grew up with for our entire life, Scooby-Doo, to be a part of those, those are, it's just a blessing. I just, I think it's a blessing. I just think it's something that I said was going to happen back then. Like I saw it when I was in the, I saw from where I was in North Carolina, to where I am right now. And that's how you got to be. You see where you want to be. All the stuff in the middle part, I never even considered. I knew whatever happens to get to where I'm going to be, I know I'm going to be, 
whatever it is, it's going to work out. And I'm going to make it work out. It has to, because if, if, if it don't work out, I'm not going to get there. I only looked at from where I was. That's why I jumped in went to California with no money, no food, no, no well and stay, not even thinking, I don't do this, it's stupid. But, and, and I didn't have, I didn't think about anything. I never had this, it was ignorant to, to go out without even thinking about well, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? Where are you going to sleep? What are you going to eat? I ain't never gave, I saw the finish line. I saw the finish line. And whatever the hell is going to happen in between the getting to there, I'm going to make it happen because I know that's going to happen. And that's how you got to do it. Well, I mean, that's fantastic. And this has just been an incredible time speaking with you. And I suppose we've spoken an awful lot about what you've done in the past. But I guess just briefly touching upon what you have coming up or what you're doing currently. Like, do you have any upcoming projects that you can share with us? Yeah, I'm a currently on a... Um, I'm currently on a TV show here in the States. It's called The Family Business. It's a gangster show we're doing. I've just finished our fourth season. I've been on it now for the last three seasons. You can watch it on BET Plus. You can download the BET Plus and watch all three years, four seasons about to start. It's on the BET Network. And um, it's a drama show. So I've been on that for little, excuse me, the last four years. I've done a couple of little independent films. Hopefully I'll be announcing a new horror movie soon. So it's something really, really good coming up. And I will let you know. That's amazing. And, is and that make any- sure you follow me. Follow me at M. <laughs> Nunez Jr. You guys put my uh, Instagram up. We oh, will. Yeah, we'll make definitely. sure that all the links to your social medias and things are in the description below for people to go oh, and follow. Oh, okay. Well, there so- you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that way people need to go and follow that. That way they can stay up to date with all the upcoming And I want to come over there when I'm in... And when I'm in the UK, I'm going to check you guys out. I'm going I'm to call you guys up because I may be going soon. Oh, oh, that's incredible. I mean, fingers crossed for yeah. that. That's like a horror convention. Y'all take me out. Y'all got to take me out. Yes, we yeah. do. That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll give you a tour of the place. <laughs> it, may be, it may be before Christmas, so so tech, tech, let, I'll stay in touch and, we'll, and I'll let you know. Oh, thank oh, you so, great. so much. That is so incredible. And thank you so much for the time that you've given mm-hmm. us today because you've been so generous with it. And we, and just we can do it again to too, you guys. Okay. Oh, we would absolutely love to. Thank you so much. And I guess that kind of wraps things up on our end. You can find links for, of course, Rihanna and Devin in the description as well. And that concludes another interview on the JBN Millie channel. Please make sure to like, comment and subscribe and follow all the links in the description below.